Greetings, my friends. This is Dr. David Donahue here for Successful Aging, Session 10. This is the end of the road, the last of our monthly sessions on the topic of immune system health and cancer prevention. Let's start with cancer prevention. Question, what is by far the biggest single risk factor for cancer? What do you think? Well, it might not be what you think. It's not actually smoking. It is age. Age is the biggest risk factor, not that we can modify our age. It's not a modifiable risk factor, but it is a risk factor nonetheless. Look at the rates of cancer for people in their 80s versus people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, just tiny rates of cancer in our younger years. But what percent of cancer is preventable? So as we look at those modifiable risk factors, what can we change? And so it turns out that a good third of cancer may be preventable by not smoking alone. Uh, about 20%, one fifth of cancer can be avoided by maintaining a healthy body weight. Diet is sort of another, diet plays a big role in body weight, but it also is the primary cause in, in another 5% of cases. A lack of exercise is important, but it's not vastly important. It has particular importance with certain Western cancers like breast cancer and colon cancer, uh, certain occupational exposure, certain viruses, exposure to viruses, like, uh, for example, um, people who work in chicken factories, and chicken processing meat factories. Um, family history plays a role. It's not something we can change our family history. Alcohol causes cancer and as does different kinds of pollution. What are the most effective behaviors to prevent cancer? Well, there you have them. We just reviewed them. Number one is probably don't smoke. Uh, number two is lose excess body fat. And independent research has suggested that as much as 30 or 40% of all cancers can be prevented through dietary measures alone. We want to avoid secondhand smoke and air pollution. We want to reduce alcohol and try to get good sleep, seven hours ideally. Which foods are most important to prevent cancer? So we know that foods play a role. Um, there's a good amount of evidence that a particular food can act as a cancer fertilizer and promote the growth of cancer, and it's called methionine. It is a amino acid, so it's a component of protein. Um, so for that reason, and there is some evidence to suggest that restricting the amount of protein in the diet can reduce our risk of cancer, but in particular, it's this one amino acid, methionine and maybe a handful of other uh, amino acids um, can act in a similar way of promoting the growth of cancer cells. But it has been described that methionine is kind of, a, kind of a, a, a fertilizer for cancer. So how can we avoid methionine? Because some of the benefits are huge. Like when you uh, remove methionine from the diet, you can extend life expectancy, not only for um, you know, rats and mice and worms and fruit flies, but also we think for humans, there's some evidence. Uh, we can reduce body fat, we can improve insulin sensitivity and reduce our tendency to diabetes. And we, there's evidence of improving memory and cognition. So there's multiple ways in which we uh, believe that methionine restriction can benefit humans. So lots of science around uh, all the different ways that um, lower methionine diets can kind of down-regulate the mechanisms of aging in our cells. Uh, so among the things that happens when we restrict methionine through either a vegan diet or a, temp or a ketogenic diet, if we're eating one that restricts methionine, uh, is it boosts autophagy, which is one of those pathways of cellular aging is the sl that slows cellular aging. When we have more autophagy, that's the clear out of the aging senescent cells. It reduces uh, the generation of reactive uh, oxygenated uh, species in the mitochondria, which is a hallmark of aging and improves met metabolism of glutathione. So overall effect is you reduce oxidative stress. Uh, what foods are rich in methionine? It's the animal products. So beef, poultry, lamb, seafood, pork, dairy, eggs, then you get to the plant-based sources of protein like nuts, seeds, legumes. Uh, legumes rich in protein, just not rich in methionine. So they're kind of the perfect protein source and also rich in fiber and no saturated fat. And there's a lot to love about legumes for longevity purposes, including 
for restricting our risk of cancer. Um, the best foods for preventing cancer. Uh, so certainly legumes, there they are. But there's a, there's a, a number of other foods that have been uh, suggested to reduce cancer risk, including garlic. And here's where you want to crush the garlic. Wait 10 minutes to allow the formation of the allicin and some of the anti-cancer compounds before cooking. Broccoli, you want to chop and stop and wait 45 minutes or so to allow formation of the sulforaphane and other anti-cancer compounds. Broccoli sprouts are the richest source of sulforaphane that we have. You can sprout them. I do this myself. You can sprout them at home. It takes about three to four days to fill a mason jar full of sprouts at a cost of less than a dollar. Uh, flax meal, turmeric, amla berries, amla and other berries, turmeric and other spices, tomato products, uh, as we'll explore, green leafy veggies, and good old green tea appears on every list this entire year. Green tea, many, many health benefits. How can we reduce the risk of cancer from ionizing radiation, such as flights and imaging? So here's the scenario as you get a cancer diagnosis, you start getting a lot of imaging. So you start um, getting even more DNA damage than you had before. Um, so not to say we shouldn't get the imaging, we should, but how can we protect ourselves when we're getting any kind of imaging, particularly CT scans um, and PET scans? So lycopene, some good science that suggests that can reduce our risk of our, our, the degree to which our DNA gets damaged by ionizing radiation. So it would be good to have yourself a sun-dried tomato salad on the day before your, um, you get your CT scan or a, a, a beverage rich in or other dish rich in tomato paste or tomato sauce. And so those forms of tomatoes, the processed forms of tomatoes are much richer in lycopene than raw tomatoes and other reddish vegetables famous for having lycopene, but they just don't have nearly as much as the tomato products. How can we best detect cancer early? So this is a big question because this is kind of uh, traditional medicine's answer to cancer. And we, we even call this prevention. What are we gonna do to prevent cancer? We're not, the strategy here is not actually to prevent cancer. It's to let the cancer form, but then hope that we can catch it and prevent it from spreading, prevent it from taking our life. So in lifestyle medicine, we would say, well, maybe we can do better. We can prevent it in the first place, but, um, but what we do want to use whatever tools we have to reduce cancer mortality, death from cancer. And so we have basically these, these five or so screening modalities. These are the main ones that we have to offer in medicine. I've highlighted the ones in green, which I consider to have the best evidence for benefit, lowest risk. So um, the, the screening for cervical cancer, including the pap smear, including H human papillomavirus testing, uh, highly sensitive, very strong reduction in mortality. You get this, you get the regular screening for this, and you you are gonna be much, much less likely to develop and die from this um, deadly disease, a low rate of false positives, and so real measurable benefit. Colorectal cancer screening is also really valuable. Um, and we definitely want to get a recommended screening there. Uh, we'll explore the different kinds of colon screening in a moment, but yeah, a 50 to 60% reduction in mortality for people who go through that screening <clears throat> with a pretty low risk of harm, but it's, it's non-zero. So we want to make sure we target this to the right populations. Um, prostate cancer screening is in pink because it's really uh, not that sensitive, I mean, reasonably sensitive, but a lot of false positives um, and not that much of a reduction in mortality. Uh, and some research says there's really no reduction in mortality. So it's, it's questionable and the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth on whether we should do PSA testing for prostate cancer. For now, it seems like it's fallen in disfavor. Lung cancer testing for um, people with a history of smoking um, can be beneficial. It does come at the cost of a lot of false positives. So people getting radiation exposure and people getting biopsies that um, they, in retrospect, didn't need. Um, but we still recommend it for people with a history of uh, smoking. Um, and then finally, breast cancer screening mammography. So this is a little bit controversial. I mean, we definitely recommend it. 
Uh, we think that breast cancer is a, is a disease of Western civilization, much more common in the West. And there's definitely things we can do to reduce the risk in the first place. So this is one of those areas where lifestyle medicine can play a big role in preventing the cancer. And if you get the cancer, lifestyle medicine can play a big role in helping you survive. So we think we can do better than just mammogram, but that just mammogram is the answer that traditional medicine has to offer for breast cancer. And it is our <clears throat> screening modality that's available. So um, it's got good sensitivity. It has a pretty high rate of false positives, especially if you start, start in the 40s. Evidence is much stronger if we start screening in the 50s, in our age 50 and above. Um, but, you know, it's not like we're reducing mortality by eight, 70, 80 percent like we do in cervical cancer. It's 20 to 30 percent. And some investigations, some big studies say zero percent reduction in mortality. So it, it's a little controversial. There's a lot of false positives, a lot of people losing sleep and going through procedures and then people getting treated for cancer that was really a false positive was never going to take their lives. So that's kind of why breast cancer is a bit of a messy disease. The nature of breast cancer is that all too often, um, it, the cancer forms and just it spreads very early in the course of the disease. So not always, but and, and we definitely can save some lives with mammography, but the decision to go through the screening means a decision to accept that we're going to get a lot of false positives and possibly be channeled down a treatment path that wasn't really warranted in retrospect. So there's our screening modalities. Colon cancer screening, we have a number of options. The red bar is the, is the um, sensitivity in a, uh, for, colon, for finding cancers, for finding colorectal cancer. So colonoscopy is the best. It's a little better than the other modalities, but the other modalities are pretty close. Where colon cancer uh, excels even a little bit more is in detecting those adenomatous polyps. So this is the ColoGuard fit fecal, fecal DNA testing, uh, which is for a lot of people replacing colonoscopy. Uh, it's just the only risk is that the, it's you're much more likely to miss that adenomatous polyp under this treatment re regimen than under colonoscopy. Uh, there's also some newer testing, uh, this gallery test. It tests for over 50 types of cancer. It's a blood test. You have to pay for it. But it's, they, the, the company recommends it for people with diabetes, obesity, or current or previous smokers because this, these populations have a higher risk and there's more to, more to be gained. One could speculate that once a year testing would be a good way to make sure that we're not going to get a cancer. Uh, we're going to learn as early as we can about a cancer and maybe be able to intervene. Now, we can certainly um, be a bit skeptical and say, well, where's the evidence that this is going to save lives? Where's the evidence that, that we're going to be able to catch something and intervene necessarily um, earlier than if we didn't do the testing? We don't really have strong evidence for that just yet. The cost is about $949, <clears throat> but you can get this test, and it's uh, some of the most advanced uh, surveillance that you can do for cancer. How can I monitor air quality? So pollution is a consideration. Uh, so you can get this AirNow app or go to airnow.gov and monitor your air quality in your area. Um, so PM 2.5 is a big causer of uh, lung cancer deaths. Um, but radon, and smoking is number one cause of lung cancer death, but radon is thought to be number two. Um, so 21,000 deaths a year from radon gas. It's a natural byproduct of the breakdown of uranium in the Earth's crust. And the trouble is that it seeps into your house and particularly in your basement. There is a new device out there from this Norwegian company, AirThings, which can help you monitor your own air quality in your house, not just the radon, but a number of other measures too. Uh, the PM 2.5, those particulate matter, the soot that results from burning stuff. CO2, which is the other by, another byproduct of burning stuff, is not healthy to inhale really high levels of CO2. Outdoors is around over 400 parts per million. And indoor environments often get up over 600, 700, and even higher. <clears throat> and it can impair cognition a bit to breathe higher CO2 levels. 
uh, volatile organic compounds, um, such as kitchen gases, fumes, and cleaning products, which have been linked with cancers. How do we treat cancer? Well, clearly you wanna see your oncologist. Uh, but if I get cancer, what kind of care might I seek out? Can I do better? Because one of the challenges with traditional oncology is we still have very high death rates. When you get metastatic cancer that is spread throughout your body, your life expectancy is very low. So we, we think that just like any other field of medicine, that uh, optimal treatment would include a, a combination of traditional medicine with lifestyle medicine. So we wanna get the best of both worlds. And how can we do that? Well, there's a field that combines the best of both worlds called integrative oncology. <clears throat> so integrative oncology integrates the best in, in, its, in its ideal state, it integrates the best that conventional medicine has to offer as well as complementary and lifestyle medicine has to offer. So certainly employing nutrition and exercise and, and uh, support groups um, and all the pillars of healthy lifestyle along with the, the chemotherapy and all the other, other interventions from traditional medicine. So if I get cancers, what steps can I follow to survive? Well, I wanted to share with you um, a checklist from an integrative oncologist named Jonathan Stigall, who has a, an excellent podcast called Cancer Secrets. Um, the thing I like about the podcast and his uh, book and his work and the field of integrative oncology is very science-based. So they're really looking at the interventional randomized trials and, and basing decisions on, on those things. So, um, so clearly, and some of this is just good oncology. When you get a cancer diagnosis, you want to get the proper diagnosis as quickly as possible. So imaging is your best friend here. Um, you wanna get an extensive set of labs. Uh, and this is what a good oncologist will do anyway. You wanna see your oncologist quickly and decide a strategy. Um, definitely don't forgo, forego conventional therapy. People who do don't live as long and suffer more. Um, surgery, uh, there's, there's certain treatments that are, have very strongly suggestive uh, interventions that could benefit people. For example, propranolol before surgery to reduce the risk of the cancer spreading at the time of the surgery. And keep in mind, you can always get a second opinion about your cancer and about uh, the surgery. Chemotherapy should be started quickly. You don't want to delay more than about six weeks after the diagnosis. This improves effectiveness and survival. Um, there's, some, there's some sort of uh, advanced thinking around chemotherapy that suggests that low dose chemotherapy can be beneficial. So this is just a discussion to have with your oncologist and maybe try to get uh, an integrative oncologist on board to suggest some of the papers that might influence your treatment. Because the, the, the benefits, what we've seen in some of the research is that you get less, you're getting the same overall dose, you're just getting lower dose with more frequent dosing. And we get less side effects and pretty significant benefits in terms of survival after the chemotherapy um, in, in some of the re research reports. Uh, fasting before chemotherapy, um, good evidence that it can reduce side effects and improve effectiveness. But a lot, a lot of the field is really still focused on making sure you don't lose weight, trying to fatten you up as much as possible. Um, but, but again, um, so here is where our integrative oncologists can help uh, educate um, your 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 more traditional oncology team. Insulin potentiation therapy might increase the vulnerability of cells that's giving insulin before the chemotherapy. Local hyperthermia, some of this is pretty advanced things that only can be done in certain settings. Immunotherapy basically means, uh, is, a, is a, a newer advanced kind of chemotherapy. And there's some approaches there as well, which I won't belabor, uh, but radiation, and this is just good practices, use it carefully and use as low dose as you can. Um, some wacky stuff like intravenous mistletoe. Um, some suggestive research suggests that it might boost survival in some settings. And uh, it might be an angiogenesis blocker, so it might effectively be a chemotherapy agent that would give an additive benefit in some cases to the chemotherapy regimen that your oncologist comes up with. Um, Nutritionally, it's important that we remember that the whole food plant-based diet is really 
strongly supported by the science as, uh, as a means of preventing cancer in the first place and surviving cancer uh, if you get a diagnosis. You want to max up on the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, nuts, and seeds. There are case reports of people uh, supposedly reversing their cancer by doing dietary changes alone. This is a very sporadic thing. It's not something we can hang our hat on, but something to keep in mind that uh, there's a good evidence that you can create an environment in the body that's more hostile to cancer when you're eating really healthy like this. Uh, minimize processed foods. You want to reduce methionine. Um, methionine, which is, as we said, was a sort of a fertilizer for cancer. So now is especially the time to avoid methionine and avoid animal products. I would suggest now is the time you get a cancer diagnosis. Now's the time to go plant-based, whole food plant-based. Glycine supplementation, this is a little bit speculative, but you could even supplement a little bit with the amino acid glycine to oppose methionine. Do all this stuff with the consultation of your oncologist. Supplements, um, and it depends, again, check with your oncologist, but these are the, some of the sorts of things that an integrative oncologist might do. I'm not endorsing any of these treatments, but keep in mind that there are, and one thing you don't want to do is high dose antioxidants during chemotherapy because those antioxidants might actually protect the cancer cells from the chemotherapy. You don't want to do that. And finally, you want to get good sleep through the whole cancer thing. You want to exercise through the cancer thing and stay connected with loved ones. Loved ones can be your lifeline and help you navigate this very complex world of cancer care. There's some interesting research on off-label use of medications. So this, this paper, Hiding in Plain View, the Potential for Commonly Used Drugs to Reduce Breast Cancer Mortality, uh, looked at a whole host of medications and found that certain ones were associated with lower cancer rates, particularly metformin, propranolol, and baby aspirin, particularly for breast cancer. But subsequent research has validated that they seem to work for other cancers in general. So some pretty impressive numbers. And one of the reasons to take metformin if you have diabetes is to reduce your risk of cancer, we think. Um, and baby aspirin is, is known to reduce colon cancer risks, but it might reduce overall cancer. And propranolol, some interesting research on breast cancer mortality by an unbelievable 81% reduction. Immune health, keeping our immune system healthy and young. So as we age, what happens to our immune system? It gets older. It gets older like any other organ of our body, just like our muscles get older and our, our nerves get older and our brain gets older. Well, our, our immune system gets older too. And we can see it in, with the reduced function against diseases. This was uh, related to COVID-19, but we have similar plots for influenza infections and many other diseases. So basically, this is a logarithmic scale. So what we see is as we age, as we get older and older, the rate of death from COVID-19 goes up and up and up, not at a linear scale. Again, this is like a logarithmic scale. Um, so no matter what country, the older you get, the older your immune system gets, the less functional it gets, and the more you're at risk for infectious disease. What causes the immune system to age? Well, it's a, it's a lot of the same things that cause our body to age in general. Sleep deprivation plays a role. Um, having an unhealthy gut microbiota, about 80% of your immune system lives in the gut around the, the, um, the, 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 col the uh, lumen of the gut where the food is going through. And also obesity, as we've discussed with cancer and stress, uh, all these things can contribute to um, the aging of our immune system. So as that immune system ages, guess what happens? We see higher rates of infection, like I just showed with COVID-19. We see lower uh, response to vaccines. So when we get a vaccine shot, we get less of a boost. And we see low-grade inflammation. So those are some of the ways we can measure that effect of uh, an aging immune system. But we also think that an aging immune system is an important driver of aging of the body. So how does it affect longevity? Basically, we talked about the pathways of cellular aging throughout this program. We talked about inflammation, oxidative stress, and shortening of the telomeres, 
and getting uh, DNA damage, cellular senescence, and autophagy. When, as we get older, our autophagy clearing out the old cells decreases. And another pathway of aging of our body is what's called immunosenescence. That means our immune system's getting older, so our body's age, uh, aging throughout the body gets older. So for example, neurologic diseases, we develop Alzheimer's and our brain ages. We develop aging of the heart and the vascular system, and we get um, heart failure and heart attacks. Uh, we have aging of the joints. We have aging of, um, of the liver, and we're more prone to diabetes. And as we've explored, uh, we're more prone to cancer because we need that immune system to pick off those cancer cells. Our bodies form many cancer cells every day of our lives, and our immune system is able to intercept most of them. But we need a young and active immune system to be as effective as possible at preventing cancer. So how does this happen, though? Well, we think maybe through oxidative damage and inflammation, that's the so-called oxy-inflammaging process. Uh, so as the, um, basically the inflammation, oxidative damage rate of, uh, is higher in a person, they're going to have more accelerated aging. And when it's lower, and so as a result, those folks with accelerated aging are going to be uh, going to see the effects of aging in every organ system. So when, uh, when people are able to reduce their inflammation, reduce their oxidative stress, the theory goes that we will slow our aging process and, and be doing uh, more healthfully at a, at a same age. How can I slow the aging of my immune system? So this is the rub. Like We want to slow the aging of our immune system so that we can slow the aging of our whole body and so we don't have to worry as much about um, getting stricken down by infectious diseases. So it's, it's the answer is very similar to how we prevent cancer. We, we don't smoke, we lose the excess body fat. We think a, a mostly plant-based diet rich in the flavonoids, avoiding other pollutants, reducing alcohol and getting good sleep. So are there any substances that boost immunity so much that they reduce illness? Well, we think there are, for example, vaccines um, vaccines are the best we got. Uh, a tiny little substance injected into your body once gives you protection for months and even a year to come or more. Years to come in, in, in some cases basically trains your immune system how to fend off invaders. Uh, for example, flu vaccine is so impactful to your health that it actually reduces all-cause mortality by about 18%. Um, so one little shot protects you for a whole year from death and also reduces the risk of hospitalization by 29%. So we think a lot of illness, a lot of sort of death and heart attacks even are come in the setting of where you have had a recent flu vaccine, uh, flu illness that you didn't even know about. You got, you got the flu, you didn't even know about it, and you died of something else. So all cause mortality dramatically reduced by getting that flu shot. So especially when you're an older person, you want to get your flu shot. Um, exercise boosts immunity too. Um, so this particular study randomized people to either get calisthenics, which is very low level exercise, or a walk, a brisk walking routine, which is higher level. And they found that over the ensuing months that um, the people who were doing the brisk walk had much lower risk, uh, over 50% reduction in the risk of getting uh, a sick, getting a cold, getting an upper respiratory tract infection. People who are highly conditioned athletes were doing even better. They had much, much lower risk. We think su certain superfoods, there's evidence for all these different foods, reducing infection risk, uh, including uh, some of our usual friends, uh, our superfoods like the cruciferous vegetables. Citrus fruits make an appearance in boosting immune health. Green tea is on every list. We want to just get your two or three cups of green tea a day without fail or decaf. Turmeric, ginger, these are familiar, garlic, berries. And here's mushrooms and nutritional yeast, also known as nooch. Uh, there's evidence that these can reduce infections and boost our immune system through their um, containing a carbohydrate called beta-glucan. Oats, which also contain beta-glucan, um, super healthy for the uh, immune system, we think, and um, nut seeds and leafy greens. So I don't know, when you get sick, maybe you want to start loading up on these foods if you're not already, and ideally eat them every day. 
So your assignment is try to reduce your methionine. See if you can't cut down on your methionine intake, shift to more plant-based nutrition. Don't fertilize whatever cancer cells are trying to grow in your body right now at this moment. Eat the immune system boosting checklist as much as you can. Those, those wonderful fruits and vegetables and green tea that we mentioned earlier. And feel free to reach out to me with your questions. And uh, I would love to be able to help you. So I hope you've found this program to be to be engaging, interesting, educational. I hope that it helps your health in some way. I wish you all the best. Take care. Be well.